Welcome to another episode of Head First with Dr. Hill. Today's guests are Brian McKenzie, who is a human performance coach and movement specialist, and Aaron McKenzie, who is a two-time gold medalist in uh, rowing. So I uh, welcome, guys. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for and, having us. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, why don't we start by having you actually introduce yourself, give us a little bit of uh, your perspective on what you do day to day. Start with Aaron. All right. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I was a professional athlete for about, ooh, 10 years. And um, now I am working for a company called Power Speed Endurance, which uh, was, is owned by Brian McKenzie. <laughs> but I am running behind the scenes. It's a endurance-based uh, programming mm -hmm. and educational source for endurance athletes and coaches. And so we are basically trying to cover all of our bases from running to you know triathlons to s rowing um and it's mostly for working professionals okay that so, so not just professional athletes no no yeah so we're trying to to uh you know now that i am a uh working professional myself <laughs> mm -hmm. and no longer professional athlete I, I see that that is the need you know there's a much bigger need for attention to giving um you know education to everybody not just mm -hmm. the elite athletes like we had we were fortunate enough to get so much information and you know have access to so many people um but the every de everyday joe that's out there slogging miles running marathons uh triathlons doing crash bees everything uh they need help too and uh absolutely even more so yeah, we don't, don't have all the same degree of dialing everything in with a lot of attention sometimes. So. Exactly. Great. And exactly. Brian, tell us yes. about, about you. Um, I, 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 my career kind of started with a more quality versus quantity approach, and that's basically where mm -hmm. I've stayed. Um, although many things have changed, uh, I, I became very adept at movement and understanding movement mm -hmm. uh, with, with people and in, in, in relation to injury uh, that in, in working with a lot of athlete la, athletes that were endurance athletes like runners um, my specialty began in running I worked with mm -hmm. a guy by the name of Dr. Nicholas Romanoff very early on in my career um, <clears throat> which catapulted kind of my learning curve into other areas versus sticking to traditional formats um, going through traditional schools things like that uh, I, I kind of and in, 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 inevitably exited out of that mm -hmm. to get more of a, a broader understanding of things that weren't being taught um, and and, and, a, and a lot of that has to do with physics or uh, not that I'm <laughs> so, I, I, I'm I, I'm doing f physics or anything uh, but understanding physics and, and things like gravity and how it works mm -hmm. with you know and how how it's a very underutilized or, or under understood you know not a very well understood thing mm -hmm. um, that is transpired into more or less just the human performance world okay um, now most of my work is done within uh, XPT uh, which is my business with Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese, which is more of a lifestyle approach. Uh -huh. So it's a whole entire holistic deal where we're looking at not only, hey, what are you doing for training, but hey, are you getting outside? Um, you know, it, as we've seen with the CrossFit revolution where, you know, a lot of people just go, they work, then they go into a gym and they're inside. And yeah. it's like, how, how, how often are you actually getting out into nature and understanding this stuff? So moving from box to box isn't, <clears throat> isn't like a life goal? No, I, I, I it, it, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm a little, I try not to get into the gym too much anymore. Okay. I right. do get into the gym, yeah. but it's just, I try and stay out of it as much as I can and try and focus out outside more often. Um, I, I more, more often than not, you're going to find me in the water okay. these days. Um, just because I, my love of the ocean sure. and, and what I'm doing there. And obviously with a relationship with a guy like Laird Hamilton, it's very easy to do since that's where he's most of his time is. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, at any rate, uh, we've, Aaron and I have really always kind of looked at things from a more qualitative standpoint, especially for her. Like when she, she dealt with a lot of injuries and stuff, and I'm sure we'll get into it, um, to really going, Hey, there's something going on. There's something else I could be doing here. Um, uh, you know, and, and Aaron was an, a very, very early pioneer or adopter of a lot of the stuff we were doing. And not, not just me, I mean, from her own side of stuff mm -hmm, where she mm -hmm. was going and implementing some CrossFit or even some movement based stuff. Um, I mean, she was mentored by Kelly Starrett. Um, so, you know, th there's a lot of, uh, you know, crossover with what we've done and how we've built that. 
did that lead into your guys getting married? Did you have that uh, the the congruent <laughs> interest before uh, uh, getting together, or I'm just curious? Yeah, that, that no. Well, I, Kelly was. I started uh, working with Kelly back in 2007, so right mm-hmm. before the 2008 Olympics. And um, yeah, I think I I was a hard subject. I ask a lot of questions. And, Good. Um, that's, that's awesome. And I think it was around 2010. Um, you know, I was going in my into my second uh, Olympic cycle, and Kelly had he was just having his his second kid graduating from PT school and he was like hey I have this friend down in Southern California uh-huh. <laughs> he was trying to was just pawning me off on Brian no but it worked really well because there's some things that you can learn and read about um, and you know research but the biggest piece was the hands-on sure like, there was nobody actually watching and giving me feedback on what I was doing I was just going implementing hence a lot of my injury history okay but yeah. um yeah so that was the big turning point once uh kelly introduced brian um to me and he prefaced it with don't make out with him okay <laughs> so um yeah so once he introduced us uh i he, he was working you know like know that you know that's not a squat <laughs> okay <laughs> that's not a push-up like let's and actually would show me um visually what I was doing and how to change it and so that was that was a huge thing mm-hmm. for for me so this is that movement specialist thing that you're that you're focused yeah on. so can you when we say movement what do you mean by movement <laughs> moving mean? sitting walking squatting okay. picking things up uh, i i just kind of it, it, it morphed from hey i was looking at how people ran mm-hmm. to oh these specific exercises we're doing to oh it's just what they're doing every day okay, <laughs> like, well, so, so you start as a runner yeah um, I, I come from a family of marathon runners. Yes. I'm one of these people who's not, I don't think I'm built to run. I'm sort of a stocky Scottish guy. I'm, I'm built for climbing up mountains, you know, and, and falling off cliffs. But yes. um, my little sister runs marathons. My dad's a long-term runner. Yeah. My body's never felt like it could handle running. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I wonder, what do you think about that? Can anyone be an athlete of any sort of these movement, you know, cycling, running, swimming? or, or Well, I, I think running is A, a basic human function. Okay. Um, and... I think people and and but there's variations of that okay. like hey am I a big guy who's probably better at climbing up something and yeah. throwing something or you know fighting something versus going and just running for days or 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 you know 26.2 miles or hunting an animal sure, you sure. know and it's like you know the, the certain whatever there, there are very specific there's very different uh, approaches to things but i think by and large and and we've seen this with crossfit as well mm-hmm. which you know and I, i'm only speaking of this because my i spent 10 years teaching you know as a subject matter expert for crossfit okay um it, i think human beings in general like to look at what the elite or what the professionals are doing sure and then they want to mimic stuff like that so they hear of something like a marathon yeah and they go damn i want to go run a marathon okay and it's not i want to go win a marathon it's i i just want to go participate in a marathon and participation yeah. is a very big di- and, and the reason i'm using this analogy is mm-hmm. because very few people want to actually spend time actually getting good at like running 5ks which is where most great marathoners spend a lot of time oh, interesting you know they became really 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 good runners mm-hmm. at the 5k actually they started well before that they were doing it at le- like less than three thousand meters gotcha and they got really fast and then they you know, extended that a yep. little bit and then they extended it a little bit more. And, you know, one of the, you know, one of the people I'll use is like somebody like Haley Gabber Selassie or even Ryan Hall, who's recently retired, mm-hmm. but both climb the ranks through those basic 5k, sure, 10k, sure. half marathon, yep. then marathon. And then you see the same, tra- you see the same types of things that happen with world-class Iron Manners. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's no such thing as a world-class Iron Manner who started Iron Manning. Right. Sure. They started doing sprint distance. They were world class. They started doing Olympic distance. They were world class. Then yep. they actually moved up to Iron. And we as a people like, st- and I'm as guilty as this as anybody because I have literally went and signed, did a sprint triathlon and was like, up, oh, got my ass handed to me there. Okay. I am going to go <laughs> sign up for an Ironman now. So I went from smallest to I'm going to go do largest, you know, and then I ended up doing ultra marathons. Um, the only thing I had in favor for me was the fact that I was looking at movement and understanding a lot of this stuff, which is where a lot of the training 
methods came from, the ideas on training, and, and even what was happening with our, my athletes at the mm -hmm. time was we were seeing people who could actually participate in these things, but they weren't necessarily doing as well as they wanted to, or they were just getting worse over time. Okay. So they had hit that plateau, and then they started to taper off, and it started to become less, and uh, age was a factor or whatever, and um, you sure. know we found that that was not the the reality of it we when you just train one specific way yep and let's just take the long slow distance approach you're basically training for long slow distance nothing's going to be fast right, so you're right. it's going to take time to get there the only issue the other issue with that is that when you ingrain bad habits in long slow mm. distance mm -hmm. that is a very long period of time that you have now taken where and think you know your mind yep. hey how many yep. how many shitty habits do i create you know and how many do i stick to how many sure. of neurotic behaviors have i associated which now has a physiological loop in it yep where i have Absolutely. emotional responses i have all these things attached to it and i can't get out of this thing right this is the exact same thing that i've dealt with and, it, and it's happened within crossfit too because people in crossfit saw what guys like rich froning who's won the games four times who continues to you know uh compete at the um team level who, who can handle a ton of volume who worked his way up to yep. developing all that volume yep. took the time to get good at the volume lost the championship you know not having a lot of volume under his belt then came back you know and it's like they see what he's doing and they want to do what he's doing and okay. it's like rich figured out what worked for him okay. if it worked out for him and it was like this was the difference between what aaron did in 2008 versus what Aaron did for 2012 and Aaron figured out what worked for Aaron okay and and if other people come in and start to replicate what it is you're doing that worked for you sure don't expect to get any better yeah than them right right you know all right, so so um, I, I did run in high school. You know, I, I had this identity as a running family, and I thought I'm gonna run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I did distance running in high school, and I was slow and you know ponderous, yeah. mm -hmm. and ended up developing really bad shin splints. Yeah, to the point where it sort of like you say got ca caught up in this baggage. His, you know, from then on, like in, in college, I was in, on the fencing team at UMass. Yeah, and we they would go run, and I would go bicycle because I just couldn't pound my shins into the ground anymore yeah um oh, interesting and so eventually i stopped running completely because i had this identity of well if i run it's gonna hurt and i never was able to get the mechanics right to not develop painful shins when running yeah so how would you deal with somebody like that who you know i, I mean i'm 45 i haven't I, run in 20 something years i mean i i've dealt with that you know i, I used to deal with that weekly you know um, uh -huh. it injury is nothing more than a movement fault okay the catalyst becomes whether it's intensity, yep. whether it's volume, or whether it's load. So those are the exposers of it. It's kind of like a stressful situation with, with the mind, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, look, we might all be just fine right now being in a very calm environment and making it safe and protective, but what sure. happens when the shit hits the fan? Yeah. You know, what happens if we take you out since, you know, Laird Hamilton's a, a, you know, somebody I work with. What happens when we go out into 60 plus foot surf? On yeah. jet skis, what are you? What what's going on with you then? Terror, and, but yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And and so we start to see things that start to change. And it's like, how do we train to get to the ability? If this is what you actually want to do, I mean, you know. And Laird has a <laughs> Laird has a an analogy about all that. And he goes, "Look, you can't make an eagle out of a chicken, <laughs> but you can make a super chicken. Right. So okay. so you know you can you you can." Train yourself to want to be to, to be able to handle si sp certain situations, mm -hmm. but if you really don't want to be there, then you're never going to be that eagle. Like you, you, you like you, you want to be. You need to want to be in front of a sixty foot wave yeah. and in yeah. that surf. You don't want to be somebody who's not like because the the thought processes that happen when you're in those situations and these are the same things that happen with running. Mm -hmm. it, it's just I'm using an extreme sense right now. People don't want don't look at it as an extreme sense, but it's the exact same behavior where it's like look. You really don't actually want to be here right yeah, now. Yeah. So there's no real sense in actually forcing this. That's definitely true for me when I was running. It was always a sense of, <laughs> oh, I got to do this because it, I, should, mm -hmm. I should be doing this, not because I want to. Uh, you know, another personal example, a few years ago, I got into century rides and yeah. um, was doing a lot more cycling. I can, yeah. you know, I'm built for a cyclist. I'm really you know, heavy, lower body. 
And um, I did a cycle, a century ride with my right toe clip adjusted wrong. <laughs> and about 60 miles in, my right knee pretty, pretty much failed. Mm -hmm. You know, the outside, some tendons on the outside of the knee. And that was like four or five years ago. And I still can't really cycle for more than a mile or two before things start to mm -hmm. lock up. So my identity is congruent with a cyclist, not so congruent with a runner. But I've managed to get injuries in both ends of things. And, you know, now all I do is aggressive yoga. So, I mean, where would you take someone like <laughs> yeah. me who would, would want well, to build these things back up? One, it's, hey, let's look at wh where the pain's where the pain's at. Okay. B, let's look if we can apply, if, if we can get you to apply any of the soft tissue strategies that we understand uh -huh. to that to start alleviating why the tightness, why everything's happening, because it's not that your knee's bad. There's no such thing as a bad knee. Okay. There's no such thing as a bad hip. There's no such thing as a bad ankle or bad wrist or bad knee or, you know, elbow. Before you're injured, at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah unless, yeah. It, unless of course, it's like blunt trauma. Like mm -hmm. you fell off of something. That's an entirely different story. Okay. Or, a, you know, a bullet. Something like, like sure. look, those are, the, that 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 is stopping movement. That's a tissue insult. Yeah. 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 Okay. So w most people are just reinforced. They're. Most people aren't paying attention to what nature's telling them. Sure. And pain is pain is nature's greatest is one of greatest its greatest assets to say, hey, wrong. Yeah. You know, you don't see animals going around and running around with toes internally rotated or externally rotated. They're following the path of the least resistance. They're always doing that. And we do that as a we do that as babies. Sure. Beautifully. Then at about five, we take our children and we go, you know what? We're gonna stick you in school. And we're gonna we're gonna force you to sit down for chair. six hours a day, yeah. and we're gonna we're gonna put you in these really cool shoes that mommy thinks are really cute, <laughs> or daddy thinks are really badass, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and and we just start to mold the being into more like us, versus allowing that child to adapt and and be pliable and understand things on its own unique, beautiful level. Okay. And 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 I'm not saying you need to have your kid barefoot and you know. You know, so, hair down to their ass and run around like sure. you know Mad Max is you know a little Mad Max beyond Thunderdome. But I, I I do think that we've really tried to systematize things because we don't understand how to deal with stress. Yep. And we think that a system is what's going to say versus our own feeling and understanding that own feeling. Like, hey, my foot, my clip was changed. Okay, so what did I do here with that clip? Yeah. So if I'm internally rotated, there's something going on structurally, and we know that you can rotate off the tib and fib at the knee a little bit, but most of that rotation is going to have to be made up through the hip. Right. So that, you know, looking most likely at things through the quads is, is where we would start, get the soft tissue work, then start to look at you from a movement standpoint, like when he's walking, what's going on, you okay. know, and then, or, Hey, let's put him on a bike for a mile and let's see where the knee, where yeah. that pain's showing up. And then we now have part of our solution is to Look what he's doing and why is the pain showing up? I think I need to visit you guys in Newport Beach. <laughs> Come on down there. So you mentioned shoes, you know, putting little kids in shoes. What is your thought about this, you know, barefoot running, zero drop? Is that important? Is it a fad? Uh, what, what? Where do you fall on that? Uh, I, I think you should be barefoot as much as you possibly can. Okay. Um, I don't think barefoot running is the answer. Okay. Um, I, I think barefoot running is great. Um, in fact, if that's what you want to do, I'm mm -hmm. all for it. I, I, I don't have any disagreements in barefoot running. Okay. Um, you're always going to run faster in shoes. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't get really fast barefoot. Um, the, a lot of the concrete and everything that we've put in, I don't know that the foot is entirely yeah. ready to yeah. handle all of that. Like, like from, from a, a legitimate, um, you know, Adapta adaptation standpoint, sure. you know, so have, have we made those changes yet? And, and I just don't know that we've made that. Um, but understanding shoes is, is, is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And Hey, my toes, they all touch. They're kind of, you know, my, my little ones are like wrapped over each other. Okay. So, so those aren't good things. Okay. Those are, those are early signs that you're probably going to have some issues upstream of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A foot should look like a hand basically. 
uh, where the, the, the toes don't necessarily touch. Mm -hmm. They might be really close, but they don't touch. Okay. Um, the entire foot should work. You should have an arch in your foot. Um, you know, not having arches is another early sign that you've probably done some poor mechanical stuff. Okay. Um, you know, can, can that be addressed? 100%. Okay. Yeah. We've seen people who've ch taken flat supposed, you know, the, sure. the term flat foot is, is actually not real. There's no such thing. Like you can actually draw the arch up off the floor. Yep. Sure. It's just a lazy stance. So you're not actually being, you're not actually in a true stable position in using the hip. You're so sort of the, slouching with your feet. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. You're, you're collapsing medially. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I, I think there's, I think there's merit to barefoot running. I, my, my suggestion is for people to walk barefoot as much as they can. Um, also, you know, if you're going to run and you're going to be in shoes, take your shoes off at the end of the run, find a grass you know, a grass, uh, field, do a few hundred meter repeats in the grass barefoot just to reinforce some better positioning. Uh -huh. Um, if you're not going to be somebody who's barefoot throughout the day, but I, I, I think understanding that any sort of a heel lift compared to the front of the foot mm -hmm. is a, is a, is a big, big thing in understanding how you can actually change a lot of things in your life. It, it, like in terms of like, in a in a bad sense like if you were to stack blocks on top of each other and you actually gave a mild lift to the very first block uh -huh. and we were stacking them six feet high those blocks by the time they got to six feet would have to be so compensated yeah just from that minor lift that we that, that you're going to be dealing with pain in some way shape or form and your wrist pain or your elbow pain may just be associated with that pain there so and, and you know and ladies like to walk around in high heels yeah um another bad you mean that, isn't, that isn't good for you that is terrible really it's terrible yeah, yeah. It, it, you, you removed dorsiflexion yeah so it's basically yeah. just saying to your ankles you don't need to work which mm. your ankles are a part of your foot your foot is your only thing that's connected to the ground uh you know like Ke kelly star at brought up years ago the the tissue on the hands the tissue on the feet is the same yep you don't have that tissue on your ass right <laughs> therefore we know what should be in contact with the ground most and it's definitely not your ass interesting yeah 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 definitely so um these are sort of, sort of getting into how you would approach examining movement problems looking mm -hmm. at causes of injury yeah re-architecturing the biomechanics better habits better training um, when someone like Aaron, you know, came with lots of injuries, I mean, Aaron, first of all, what was that, you know, psychological, mental, you know, you, you had, you obviously were pushing through injuries, being relatively successful in spite of, you know, wear and tear and weathering mm -hmm. these things. What was the different mental game once you started to change how you moved? What, what did it do to the, how you pushed your body, how you got injured, how you felt about your day-to-day -day training pain and things like that? Yeah. So I kind of, I come from a standpoint of, uh, I, I danced actually the first 12 years of my life, mm -hmm. you know, modern, classical, everything. And I think movement is an expression. I don't think that there's a right and wrong. Sure, there's something that puts you into pain mm -hmm. and doesn't. Um, but if you are continuing to get injured, yep. um, I think you are wanting to suffer. Okay. You know, you're wanting to put yourself in that place <clears throat> unconsciously some, sure. most of the time, you yeah. know. Um, and I think that's where I was mentally at the time when I was continuing to get injured and I thought you know rowing and any endurance sport that was that was what I was told it was just a game of suffering okay it's you just everybody just had to power through it yeah and that was the coaching cue it's like if you want to go faster go harder yeah instead of like no you can actually you know go tweak smarter. a little bit here yeah. tweak a little bit there it's just you know that was that was the a lot of a lot of the feedback that I gravitated to as well is like, oh, you know, I just need to make it hurt more. Right. And then, okay. and, and you were a world-class athlete at this point with this mindset. Yeah. And, and I was, you know, praised for that too. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and as are a lot of other uh, athletes. And I think that's what, you know, what draws people to endurance sports sometimes. Okay. They're just like, oh, how long can I suffer for? You know, I, how can I suffer better? And it's like, if you're going into it with the idea of you wanting to suffer, then yeah. there really is more emotional things tied into sure. this movement. And maybe that is that is the cure, you mm -hmm. know? Maybe mm -hmm. that, that is that you have to go out and, like, Brian went out and suffered for 100 miles, and then he realized that, you know, 
okay, well, that's not really getting me anywhere. Like that's not answering these questions mm -hmm. um, that I still have. So now I need to, to look inside. Now, of course, as an athlete, you're always learning, you're always evaluating, you're always sort of, you know, personal records and training routines. Did your mindset change when you started to get some movement, sort of meta supervision on the movement uh, and how you were doing? Uh, or rather, how did your mindset yes, it change, Yes, it was more, it was, it was a relief mm -hmm. that it wasn't just about going harder. Okay. You know, always going harder and like, sure. and that injury is a sign of weakness. That's the other big thing that, uh, you know, a lot of coaches and, and I don't blame them. Like sometimes I, I, you know, I am coaching now a bit too. And I have no other, you know, when you have no other excuse or no other, you know, no other guidance to give your athlete, it's sure. like, Oh, you're just weak or yeah. you're unfit or, you know, you're just not made out because injuries are c continue to show up. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it really, that's, that's kind of the easy way out you know, to, yeah. to blame it on, on the, the athlete yeah. versus the coach being like, okay, let's figure this out. Okay. Obviously what, what we're doing or the cues I'm giving you are not resonating. And that's the hard part about being a coach. Like shit it's, and granted I had, you know, a lot of years figuring out my body and feeling sure. and, and now I know what feels right and what feels wrong, but a coach can't feel the athlete like they have to just see biomechanically right. does it look right 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 and so it's one thing for it to look right and it's another for the athlete to actually be able to feel it yeah interesting so I don't have a good sense of rowing um, I mean I, I've done some running I've done some cycling my experience of rowing is being you know a freshman sophomore at UMass Amherst and all the other freshman sophomores were getting up at 4 a.m. And coming back at 6 a.m. completely beaten up, bleeding hands, and then watching these incredible changes in their bodies over the first few years and yeah. first few months in college. And they became these sort of massive athletes, but it looked to me like they were just, you know, they had these brutal, brutal early mornings and they were just being sort of shaped into new people over a few months. Hmm. That's probably not how the average person rose, if I had to guess, like especially those who aren't doing it sort of professionally at a competitive level. Mm -hmm. What are some of the benefits that, you know, the average person would get doing some rowing? learning that that skill yeah that, that, that i think sport. it's it, that's kind of the initiation that's funny because i was just coaching some guy and he's like yeah i wanted to row but i didn't want to wake up early and it's it's kind of the self-weeding process uh -huh. again it's it's a sport that has has tradition and just suffering okay. you know like instead yep. of being like oh let's tweak this it's no can you show up at 5 a.m right Right. So That's can some middle-aged non-rowing guy like me? But uh, now, yes, I think I think rowing can open up its doors to a lot more people because mm -hmm. it is such a great um, full body exercise. And especially for people who have history of, um, you know, joint issues. And it's mm -hmm. a new, you know, it's a new movement that a lot of people haven't done before. Like a sure. lot of people have tried running. A lot of people have tried cycling, swimming. Right. Um, rowing, you know, is really low impact on the joints. Um and it's just, it's a very fluid, rhythmic movement. Right, that right. I think that's, that's part of, the, that's what really drew me to it, especially from my dancing background, is just you get to this point where you feel like you aren't even working anymore because you just fall into this rhythm. And just especially... flying across the water. Yeah, even on, even on the concept two or the, you know, the static ergs that are mm -hmm. uh, the in the gyms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Um but the best part of it is actually I have my uh, teammate here from Serbia. She uh -huh. was uh, rode at Cal with me in 2005. We were just talking about this yesterday of like the best part of rowing is rowing with someone else uh, to get to fall into sure. their rhythm. And yeah. like you just have this connection. Of course, you guys are both going through pain, but it's really not that painful when someone else is doing it with you and you right. just fall into this rhythm together and it's a, it's a really like it's a rad thing yeah i've certainly I, I grew up in boston area so i've certainly seen uh on the charles you know there's there's amazing teams of people perfectly synchronized with a coxswain you know calling time and it's just yeah. it's a beautiful thing but honestly my own experience of rowing is being a little kid in a rowboat you know yeah. and, and rowing out to like pull lobster pots in a you know yeah. in a bay or something so it's not exactly the same kind of experience functional rowing Functional yeah. rowing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so. And then I think, you know, if you if you do get in the gym or even take roll the rowing machine out of the gym, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> it's my preference these days to get a little vitamin D. But, um, you know, start start on the rowing machine, figure out the movement and then add the instability of the water. OK, um, because or, you know, just 
go in the water and then put on a bathing suit and <laughs> don't it's it's okay if you and fall in that's right be, be yeah. okay with getting be wet okay with getting wet yeah, yeah exactly just, um but yeah no it's it's a sport that i think we can it can open up a lot more doors the only so the the main reason that rowers like to get up that early yep to row is because the water is flat Ah, uh, because it's calm. Yeah, it's the weather. It's calm. Okay. Yeah. And so, sure, yeah, there's definitely the initiation. Can you wake up? Right. Will you wake up to be part of this team to, you know, commit to everybody? But also, it's a lot easier to row when the water's flat. Interesting. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, of course, my experience of rowers is in college where they're all doing it before our classes. So they're mm-hmm. going to, like, the, the Connecticut River and Massachusetts. And, you know, they'd be coming back at, like, dawn. So they'd be, they'd be yeah. very, very early. Yep. Uh, so that's interesting. So, uh, of course, uh, you, Brian, are a, a water guy, it sounds like, these days. Do a lot of your workouts in the water, a lot of your yeah. personal exercise. Um, you know, I grew up on the water. I, w- I sailed boats, pulled lobster pots in, in the Northeast. The ocean, in spite of being that, I mean, I'm terrified by the ocean. I, I, I'm on it a lot. Most but people But I'm are. still terrified by yeah. it. So how do you go from that sort of, uh, you know, appreciating the majesty and danger of it from afar to being somebody who's, you know, between 20 foot waves uh, where, where's that is inflection i mean I, i've been living in california now for like 15 years well 10 12 years um this idea of starting to learn to surf is kind of exciting but yeah. I'm, a, I'm a kid from maine like I, yeah. the idea of surfing is a little bit strange to me well it's it, it that's an interesting question but you know i, I mean maybe it doesn't is it all to, mental if, if it has is to it? do with waves yeah. like you, you just need to have a love or passion for the waves and want to be able to progress that uh-huh. if it's for the ocean like i want to go like there's guys like there's guys like mark healy who who's one of the greatest watermen in the world big wave surfer um free diver spear fisherman yep. um, i mean he has an intimate intimate relationship does a lot of conservation work with in the the, the constructs of you know the ocean um he's mm-hmm. a ginger kid that lives in that lives in you know oahu okay um, you know his life has been literally you know he's not supposed to be in the sun that much yeah i completely understand <laughs> right, that. right yeah you yeah. know um and, and and but he is he's mm-hmm. figured out how to do it he's figured out how to go and be deep in the ocean and get and be, have relationships with things like sharks and understanding yep. sharks deeper um you know or you know but it's the 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 interesting part of the question is it's like look you know and although i brought up like 60 foot waves or whatever i'm not riding 60 foot waves yet um but i'm out there and i want to be out there and it drives me to want to be out there um i i've been doing some towing in for probably the last four or five years now with friends who are connected in that world um and that's been a progression itself it's interesting because being around somebody like a Laird Hamilton or a Mark Healy, um, mm-hmm. people are are fascinated with what they do, and they're okay. like, "Oh my God!" I mean, how do you ride these waves? And 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 you know, Laird, Laird's ridden hundred foot plus waves, and and that isn't really something fathomable by the by normal. Even if you see it on video, if yeah. you were to watch it like live, it's an it's an un like you can't understand it, and. The the idea is, is it's like how did you do that and it's like well what you're not looking at mm-hmm. is that that there was some this kid that c- made a commitment yeah when he first learned what a wave could what he could do with a wave yeah and he continued to chase that commitment and try and understand that commitment and everything around that commitment and how it transpired like mm-hmm. it started with shore break it got a little bit bigger it started with understanding the ocean floor and mm-hmm. why the ocean mm-hmm. you know why waves do what they do and it you know and, and uh, you know it just goes on and on and on and on what you can learn and nobody's going wow what a commitment you right made to right this. they're like wow what skills you have mm-hmm. yes yeah. or yeah. you're just so talented right and, well right. it's no different than the example you just gave of the marathon runners or or even like the rich fronings like you know and i think that's i i have a you know i'm not extremely comfortable in the ocean either mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i think sometimes what i think our biggest fear is is to be out in a situation that we're not comfortable with sure but yeah. everybody can stick their feet in the water Right. Everybody can start there. Everybody can walk around the block. Just start somewhere. Just become, I, and I think it's with everything that you're scared of, it's not jumping into the deep end. Right. It's literally yep. just getting your feet wet. 
So this commitment that you know you're speaking about, Brian's speaking about, is sort of like um, developing a different or a, a, a continuing depth, deepening relationship with what you're doing. How much of that is similar in your perspective to what happens when you're mastering endurance, mm-hmm. you know, long distance mm-hmm. uh, uh, activities? How much of it is is the relationship versus the brute forcing it and keeping yourself going? Depends on the person. Okay. Depends on the athlete for sure. Yeah. I think there's some people, and that's that's literally you know why I look at someone like Laird. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a he's a different athlete. He has it's more of a relationship uh, with the water. Okay. Um, and himself and you know nature mm-hmm. versus a lot of athletes, including myself, that I've been around. It was a race to yeah. win. Yeah. Um, and to train, to win, to, uh, you know, and you're just doing it to, for some glory mm-hmm. and being, you know, fine, going on the other side of the rainbow, sure. you know, standing on top of the podium. Um, I can tell you that that last, uh, you know, well, about the length of the national anthem, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, sure. and then it's then it's it's over. And then granted, you have, you know, those stars on your shoulder, yep. but. If you have a relationship and you have an appreciation for the your movement practice or whatever you mm-hmm. decide to do, whether it's it is studying uh, or getting you know you know getting being a neuroscientist, it's like you have to have a relationship with it rather than wanting something from it. So you've podiumed a lot. You've been up on that <laughs> that those steps a lot. Yeah. Now you're uh, retired. You're you're a coach essentially yeah. at this point. I'm old and out of shape and. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I think I'm the oldest, at least in shape, person sitting at this bench right now. But that's all right. Um, how has your relationship with rowing changed? I mean, do you still do long distance endurance driven? Do you still like to, you know, get behind the the oars, uh, so to speak? Or are you is your relationship with that whole process shifting a little now? Yeah, I mean, yeah. if we could put some um, nodes on my head <laughs> to measure all the uh, emotions and uh-huh. and whatnot that you go through, it's it's been a process, and it's been four years since yeah. you know the last olympics um and everybody it was so funny because everybody was like oh do you miss being there do you miss going yeah. like how was it and then it's like at first i was just pissed when people are asking but as <laughs> brian and usually and i remind him as well when you're pissed and like angry about something it's usually because you need to understand it more yeah sure, <laughs> you know sure sure um and so i i think what i've taken away from it is that it's it's hard to step away. So having that relationship of just wanting to win, just, you know, being top of the podium, being mm-hmm. driven of just being the best in the world. Sure. It gets you, gets you on top of the podium. Yeah. Um, but then the aftermath of that, and I decided to retire, not fi- for physical reasons, okay. but for, I, I just knew there was so much more I wanted to experience in the world. It must be a very singular drive if you're an Olympic athlete or have Olympic aspirations so much of your life, um, you know, across four-year cycles, must be focused on that moment of competition. That's sort of this looming thing in the future you must hit because it's only yes. coming around every so often. Yes, and with that, you get a hall pass by everyone. Um, you know that loves Sacrificing you, loves you deeply, else. yeah, <laughs> and understands. And with that, you lose. I mean, like I lost a lot of friends who were just like, no, you're like aren't you aren't being a good friend. You aren't being, staying in touch. Like Mm -hmm, when you, mm -hmm. when I have kids or, you know, get married or there's a funeral, you aren't there. So no, you're not a good friend anymore. And, and I think that's the thing that a lot of people sometimes are, and they still would be like, Oh no, I understand. You can't go anywhere. You have to, you have to train for this, but you're so, you get this hall pass for like, you know, four to eight to 12 Mm -hmm. to 16 years of your life Mm -hmm. that it's okay to not be, you know, a contributor to society, really, sure, sure. Um, because you have this bigger goal in mind. Um, and I and I think, uh, you know, I, I, this is obviously just where I am with the whole mm-hmm. movement. I think mm-hmm. the Olympics are a wonderful thing because it still really is an amateur uh, yep. Yep. contest. But I and, you know, originally it was just a practice to or a, a you know, event to praise the human body and, and sure. what it can do. And, and it's a beautiful thing for mm-hmm. sure. But what a lot of people don't see is on the back end of that, like what happened to all of those Greeks after, you right. know, they were, it's, it's like racing horses. 
what happens to the racing yeah. horses? Yeah, glue, you know? glue. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think that's kind of where I've been heading and just kind of watching my teammates and how mm-hmm. they've been adjusting, whether they immediately adapt that to a new goal, Okay. Um, which I've tried to do and I've tried to like, I'm going to go run a 50 miler. Uh-huh. I'm going to go do, you know, and, and just taking that drive. But that's... Um, are you finding places in your life to apply that same, like, you know, 10,000 foot goal kind of approach and, and pursue those things? Or are you um, working more in the microcosm now? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to use different parts of my body besides just willpower. Okay. All right. <laughs> if that makes sense. Sure. Absolutely. You know, like there's, yeah, I'm just going, you know, studying into, you know, yoga, uh, the study of yoga, not uh-huh. really actually doing too much yoga, okay. but I, I really, I really like, cause you know, the sauna or the, the movement practice mm-hmm. is just one piece of it. It's sure. actually, a, you know, there's a lot of really good, um, pieces written about it and uh you mm-hmm. know buddhism and all of that and you know without making me sound like i'm doing going too far into the weeds sure. it's the only thing that's really resonated with me to to make sense of this all mm-hmm. of like mm-hmm. okay you've burned out your willpower you used it a lot and you got really far yeah but i i've had a hard time applying it to something else and sticking with it and it's most likely because that flame is like, it's burnt, Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and it's also gotten focused in one specific direction for a long time. I imagine it's hard to, you know, refocus that a little bit. Yeah, so. yeah. And, you know, I have a, a very good partner um, and he's, you know, he is nine years the wiser um, of me, <laughs> but he just kind of sits back and, and is watching this process of, uh, you know, me trying to figure things out. And mm-hmm. I And I do think that, in a big way, um, athletes could be on, you know, have the same wavelengths of addicted, mm. you know, people to substances. Sure. Yeah. That certainly um, happens in, in uh, athleticism. I mean, everything from the that is <clears throat> distorted body image to orthorexic diets where you've got to be this way about mm-hmm. your diet. And, well, I mean, it, it's anxiety, it's depression, mm-hmm. it's alcoholism, it's drug addiction. It's, I mean, you want to know the list of you know, drug addicts and ex-alcoholics that are doing ultra marathons. And most probably of them. Ch- most yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a it's a adrenaline very adrenaline is a drug. Yeah, a dopamine is a drug. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So so um, not everyone, of course, is going to be an elite or a long you know distance athlete. Um, you mentioned yoga. What other sorts of other sorts of you know lifestyle, if you will, activities do you think are useful or beneficial, both mentally and physically, for folks to engage in who aren't necessarily dedicating vast resources to becoming yeah. profoundly good athletes? You know, what what, what things are helpful or, or should be. One of encouraged. our good friends, uh, Doc Hickey, he says, the best workout is the one you do. Is the one you do. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I, I said <laughs> Although I'm sure he didn't yeah. make that up. You know, like it's yeah. just it's it is. Um, that's the first thing again, it's just getting your toes in the water, okay. you know, like start with that. And I think we all have these, uh, including myself, I know it very well, like these grand dreams of like, I'm going to have this perfect workout. I'm going to do, you know, workout six days a week and then rest one day off. Sure, sure. And even at the elite level, that doesn't happen. Okay. You get injured, yeah, you know, sure. you get sick, uh, some, your partner gets sick, um, things happen and so i think when we hit those hitches of like mm-hmm. you know your knee hurts and usually injury is what makes people stop moving right and unfortunately you know my parents that was the big thing that they're now you know getting hip replacements knee replacements sure. having diabetic issues yep. because yep. they have injuries that they just didn't wanted to learn more about sure um, or, or maybe we didn't know. I mean, you know, our, our, our parents are old enough that medicine has actually advanced in the past few decades. Um, my mom mm-hmm. uh, had a, some knee problems, uh, you know, built kind of like me, you know, short and yeah. stocky. And um, about 10 or 15 years ago, she had bilateral knee replacement. And she was, I don't know, like 55 or something, pretty young for knee replacements. But yeah. had both oh. done it once <laughs> and went from being a slightly overweight, slightly kind of tired, you know, uh, middle-aged person my God, now she exercises four to six hours a day. 
she canoes, she swims, yeah. she, I mean, she's 67 or 68, yeah. and she works out more a day than I ever have in my life. Wow. And yeah. it was just, you know, getting well, her knees back functional freed her to engage yes. all this activity. And you've yes. got surgeons who, you know, you've got orthopedics that'll do surgeries based on that. And, and that's why we should be doing surgery. Mm -hmm. Not for functional ability. Not, yeah, not because you've just worn this out and you're just going to go wear that out and yeah. you're not going to do that. Or, 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 you know, you're just going to. We, we've fallen into this world where we use Western medicine as a, as a means to take care of our lives. Okay. That is not what it's intended for. It's intended, what do you mean? Yeah. To, yeah, like like prescription medication, yep. like knee replacements, hip replacements. I mean, I, I've had my hip resurfaced. Like I've had my hip kind of pretty much redone other mm -hmm. than having it, re, you know, the, the bone replaced. Sure. Um, uh, you know, we, we get into these places where, hey, if I just continue to take this or I've got this crutch, I can continue to do what it is I'm doing. So basically I'm mm. buffering off the behavior of right. the stuff that's getting me into trouble. The festering wound underneath the bandage. Yeah, exactly. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, that, and 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 this is. I mean, we, and we deal with a lot of, you know, mental disorders or even people who are drug drug addiction things like that. Like I have dealt with this stuff for twenty years. Okay. Um, I've trained people for about the same time. I saw a direct connection between people and exercise and either alcoholism, drug addiction, mm -hmm. the same patterns that are going on. Sure. You know, and these aren't people who go out and drink alcoholically or do drugs, right? right? right. But they're doing the same type of behavior pattern. And, and it's like, you start to catch on to this and it's like, yeah, what are we really not dealing with here? Like, and, and it was just, I mean, hey, that was part of me actually having to really stop, not drink and understand why sure. when I drank, I did the things that I did and, you know, oh, that's why. And it's like, it's not that... You know, my I, I'm I'm my identity is I am an alcoholic, or because right. because I'm not. I right. drank an alcohol, right. and if I want to live on that, sure I can. But I'm no further away from that than I ever was, right? Sure. But if I'm going in and I'm using the exercise, or I'm using the 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 medication yeah. to to just continue to eat the shit that I want to eat right. and bang my knee or let my knee hurt. And then, you know, just continue going yep, down that yep, cycle. Yep. Why should, uh, that's not what Western medicine was intended for. Gotcha. And, and that's, we, so we've got a big misconception of it. Okay. It makes sense. I've, I've done a lot of addiction work myself. Yeah. I, I um, actually have worked in, a, in a, an alcohol. Yeah. And I, I have a, I, a former clinic I used to work in. Uh, where we had a moderation approach where we reintroduced alcohol into your life if you were abstinent and wanted to try to drink again. Um, and mm -hmm. the whole focus of that center was not so much the substance you were using or the consequences. It was the relationship with the substance. Yes. And it sounds like the, yeah. that's congruent with the, yeah. with the uh, obsessive exercise. It's the relationship and with the experience. Yes. That's Even just with regulated. growing, yes. you know, now it's mm -hmm. like I, I was obsessed with it. Really? And I, now it's like, I, everybody's like, Oh, don't you just go out for like a paddle and it's beautiful. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I still am not at the point where you can enjoy it. But with all of this, Movement is still a necessary thing for us humans. Sure. Um, and I think that it is a good way to balance out the stress we create upstairs. Okay. Um, so, I mean, as much as we're, I think we're on, we're definitely on the, on the other side. We're, we're talking about people who are obsessive yep. exercisers, worker outers, fitnessers, you know, sure. um, or even per se elite athletes. Yeah. You know, there has to be some obsession in there. Yeah. And I see it. Yeah. Do you think you would have been as successful as a rower if you had not been obsessed in 2007 exactly. and 2011? No. I mean, would you and have been for that this, year? And it's, it's so funny because everybody's like, oh, you know, Rich Froning like works out five times. If you, This guy who won some CrossFit Games thing, if uh -huh. you didn't know who that is. But anyhow, it's a guy who is very, very successful and an extremely good athlete. But he came and worked with Brian. And I, this was in 2013 okay. or 2012, and I literally was watching him, and I was like, "Yep, he's in the matrix. Like he okay. is in there, obsessed, like, obsessed." You recognize that that glaze, that 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 yep. ten thousand year old stare yep. on a goal that Which was, yeah. I think us as humans are, we praise it. We we mm -hmm. look at it and look at it as such like this thing that's we all envy and are like, "Oh, we I wish I was in that tunnel with you," yeah. you know. Yeah. 
Um, so there's other ways of being successful as an athlete beyond that? Is that what we're hearing? I, that's what I think. Okay. I mean, I don't... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out before I, I talk too much about it because I'm like, I swear there has to be another way up the uh-huh, mountain. Uh-huh. There really does. And I, and I know I've, I've met some athletes that have had this great relationship with their movement practice mm-hmm. or they continue to just move throughout their whole life. Um, you know, Laird being one of them, I think there's a slight obsession there for sure. He has oh, to get in the water. Right. If there's no waves and he there's nothing to do, like withdrawal. You, you don't want to be around the house like within like a, a mile or so. Okay. He just has so much pent up energy. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, he yes, and, and he buffers that off, and and he, but he does have that obsession, and I think mm-hmm. that's, a, but it's a healthy obsession to a large degree. Okay, that I think we're trying to get to, like where you got to understand what a healthy obsession is, and how to take that down a notch mm-hmm. in, in the reality. Because here's the problem: is that the real world doesn't work on a competitive basis like the athletic world. When you don't win a deal right. or get something or somebody or you lose a client, yep. that that that's not losing. That that's like, hey, there's no, going to be another one, right? Sure, <laughs> like, sure, real soon, you know. And it's not you, you look at four years, and if you right. lose the race, that's a big, big problem. And it's not just the next four years <clears throat> that you've sort of lost. It's also the the two to three to four years you just put in getting here, right? Yeah, so and then you're thinking about that, yeah. you know. And and yeah. so that so it's, eight, it's really an eight year cycle to base on your sport in in terms of one opportunity for exertion and success. Yeah, but every I mean, eight years. Aaron. I think, in my opinion, Erin, although we're talking about how her experience out of the Olympics now Mm -hmm. has happened, Erin navigated pretty well from 2008 to 2012. Okay. In 2008, she had how many rib injuries by 2010 had you had? Five? One a year. Yeah. Yeah. She had five. She had broken five ribs. She had basically been a mess. How do you break ribs rowing? How, 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 is it just your muscles? It, have... it comes like you can feel like sh- it a dude, mile it's like away. You've had shin splints. It's yeah. shin exactly splints like on shin the ribs. Splints. You can so start feeling like this the... little impulse. Uh-huh. And it's just literally, you know, a lack of mobility. And then also your shoulder being out of position. Okay. And it just strains uh, a certain part, um, you know, is and of your muscles you just get tight and they yeah. can't move and your ribs are actually pretty flexible sure, right sure, of course, and dynamic. then you also have your lungs and diaphragm hitting from the inside and so Got you know it. perfect storm right interesting perfect storm All right. yeah, but, yeah so i mean it, it, but just to parlay on that is it's like she went from being injured to yep. not having any injuries to crying at the end of a, a, a gold medal race because she felt like she didn't work that hard Mm. in the race and she could have gone right back out and rode again and it was like well no that's what it's supposed to feel like when you're healthy okay you know not beaten down worn down tore right. up but i was looking for the suffering yeah yes. you know when i was running in high school uh we would run it was cross country so long distances mostly and half of us would stop the race and throw up at, at the end of the race like that that was yeah. like a sign we had we had given it uh-huh. we had, you know yeah. left it all and left it all in the field so to speak yep. um and i that didn't always i was like i was always a little bit sort of dismayed by that that all yeah. these you know amazing runners were hurling into the bushes at the end of our cross-country reg so yeah. i don't know so let me ask you guys let's finish up with this um yeah. you have a really broad experience working with elite athletes being elite athletes working with uh let's say prosumers people that are you know Mm -hmm. um not quite the elite uh, but still very uh oriented towards fitness crossfitters etc across all types of people are there any commonalities any things you think are principles that are important to hold in mind as you engage with movement as you consider your body as you move through challenges are there principles that that seem to be true across uh, people, regardless of what level they're performing at, in terms of continuing to move further and better and 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 uh, get more control over what you're doing. Hmm. It's the uh, stump, the uh, the the, the wow. guest part of the question. No, this is the most quiet part of the whole podcast. Wow. <laughs> so let's let's say if uh, if you had three call, things that, yeah. that that were the most critical things to tell people about you know well, movement, about success <clears throat> in life, and here. and we're just talking about every everybody, yeah, in general. Yeah. About are there things that are true across, no matter at what level you're performing, what what might be true? Just start. Okay. Just start. Yeah. yeah. And again, I think that's kind of where I've gotten and with 
analyzing my biomechanics and it's not, you know, there's a perfect way to move and mm -hmm. I'm injured and there's, I think being scared of injury or yeah. being scared of doing it wrong is a much bigger barrier than actually just, you yeah. know, than we actually, just start. Okay. <laughs> just get your toes in, right. toes in the water. Um, and, and that's how, you know, every, everything begins really. And I think it's, again, what we're talking about throughout the whole thing of like, mm -hmm. don't, go run a marathon don't go try to surf a hundred foot wave okay um and some of that's mental preparation we're talking don't about don't go try too, to right? race 100%. Yeah. yeah yeah just just start and practice get into the practice of it don't get into the competition or the race of it so yeah. do you think the 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 equation of performance is you know more heavily weighted towards uh the perspective and mindset versus the physical is it, it is it largely a mental game Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Sure. One hundred percent. I I think you just need, like Aaron said, is just starting. That's an action. That's yep. just taking part in something that's going on in your head. Sure. So if you don't actually like, if you're just thinking about something that I want to do and I have some fantasy about this thing, sure. but I'm afraid of it. Yeah. Just go do it. Go do it on the most basic level. Mm -hmm. Start it. Move. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. moving is just something fundamentally we were not we are designed to not not do right if right. you stop moving the game's over okay. like you're you're checking out real soon sure guaranteed sure. and and we we see just as many people who are checking off this planet yeah it, because of not moving as because of some disease like cancer or absolutely or, or whatever it, yeah. it, it's like you 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 uh, you know have somebody i don't want somebody taking care of me when i get older I yeah, do the health not want risks that. of not moving are profound. There's a study out a couple of years ago. I'm a gerontologist. I teach courses in gerontology at UCLA. Oh, wow. yeah. um, and one of the things we, we I harp on a lot um, is that uh, sedentary lifestyle, which used to be defined for elders as less than 5,000 steps a day. Now it's defined as less than 7,000 steps a day. Less than that produces as many health risks, cardiovascular health risks, as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Wow. So, yeah, you know, we, we have control over this. Stuff. I mean, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Andy Galp, they just finished up some study over in Sweden and they found out that the three correlates, the three yeah. things that left, gave us not only longevity of okay. life, but quality, but quality yep. right? Were VO2 max. Okay. Not getting below, I believe it's 22 and a half. Okay. So if your VO2 max drops below 22 and a half liters, okay, mm -hmm. you're done. Okay. <laughs> Lean tissue mass okay. in the legs. Yep. And the ability to stand up. Yeah, that's another gerontology thing. Yeah. Um, a classic gerontological sort of, you know, if you can do one assessment gerontologically, give somebody a chair without arms, have them sit in it, and have them lift up, stand up without using their arms. Yeah. If the quads are strong enough and balanced enough to lift you up off a chair without using your arms, your body's probably not aging that dramatically. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and so. I, so I mean, just going back to like these things, I think movement is a big like just starting huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having a movement practice is huge. That means doing things that require functional movement, okay. not just the same things every day, every you know, day in day out. I think CrossFit's done a phenomenal job with with that. You know, is is introducing what functional movement can be and changing that around, varying it around. Um, you know, and understanding that stuff. And I, I honestly, I think a positive mental attitude on the entire thing okay. is, is absolutely 100% unequivocally going to keep you there. Great. I think that's wonderful yeah. advice. Uh, when we stop there folks, but, uh, if our listeners and viewers are interested in finding more about you, your programs or companies, your philosophies on life, where can they find you? Where, where should they hunt you down? Yeah. Uh, well, you can find both of us at Power Speed Endurance. Just building that bad boy up. Okay. Um, dot com. Dot com. com. And then, um, yeah, Brian is XBT Life uh, as well. They're okay. doing experiences. But, uh, yeah, on both either channels, uh, one of them's more of the programming sport focused. Okay. One trying to bring health back into sport. Um, Sounds and, great. And we're going to... We're, we're, we'll, we'll probably have some talks uh, after this, but yeah, bringing in uh, more of the mindset of, of endurance sports and helping, you know, athletes that way. But, and yep. then XPT, XPT lifestyle, yeah, yeah. lifestyle so, you know, un unpack XPT for me. I've heard the acronym, but 
Uh, extreme performance training. Okay. So you're looking at something that might, you know, it, like it inevitably can become extreme because if you start from that small level. Yep. Um, so we've introduced a lot of the water, uh, waterman training that mm-hmm. Laird mm-hmm. has done over the years, which is in a pool with dumbbells. Um, this, so there's a lot of hypoxic work, but it's, it's work. It's hypoxic not about meanings. Uh, you're, you're holding your breath. You know, you've got to be, you're underwater working with dumbbells. Got so, it. um, what are the benefits there? I have a, uh, a slight follow-up question, but what are the benefits yeah. for hypoxic? What, what's, what's the theory there? Uh, there, I mean, think of, sw- think of a swimmer getting fitter throughout a season, uh-huh. like their, their ability to, for CO2 retention and ability to absorb CO2 gets greater and greater and greater. Interesting. Most, a lot of people, including like sympathetic dominant people, uh-huh. um, are very, very, they are not CO2 tolerant. And so they become, and the ability to actually get more oxygen into the tissue. Yep. So you can, there, there's studies that show hypoxic training will get, will have kind of like, uh, we'll, we'll get more of an EPO like response in the, mm-hmm. in the, in the tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the body will create more hematocrit hemoglobin out of it. Um, we do that's, a lot of heat and yeah, ice that's the training. physical part, but for, I mean, all the XPT the, stuff, yeah. I think there's the measurable stress response, yeah, yeah. um, that, you know, hold a, hold a weight yeah. underwater. Yeah, that's twelve gonna, foot that's deep. That's going to stress here, here, you out, right? Yeah, sure, Here's sure. a couple Figure of thirty pound relax. dumbbells, and we're going to sit, put you in a twelve foot deep pool. Interesting. And you know, you drop down to the bottom, and there you are, and you're like, "Wow, right, right, I'm right. pretty deep right now." Yep. And then you're going to run across, or you're going to swim across, or you're going to do something across, you know, whatever. It, it, it builds a confidence that really isn't there, as with well people. as absorbing more. I've CO2 never or, seen yeah. anything in my life, and I swam competitively mm-hmm. for twenty years. Mm-hmm. So I swam laps. I'd been involved in a lot of swimming stuff. Yeah. I've never seen anything build confidence in the pool for people or better in, than what this in is. Water. Yeah. Yeah. In water in general. So we do that. We do a lot of heat and ice therapy stuff, um, for the recovery aspects and for the adaptation aspects of it. So we're getting a lot of the stress responses out of that sure. stuff, but, but teaching people how to deal with that. Um, and then there are things like the gym training, the stuff we do where we apply method to it. Like, Hey, why are we in the gym squatting? Well, right. you're going to need to squat the rest of your life. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Um, you know, the, the, uh, beach workout stuff. Um, we do, uh, there, there's just a lot around lifestyle and we get people to go out and, you know, do more surfing, paddle sports, climbing mountains, get into stuff, get into nature. Interesting. Yeah. yeah the hypoxic stuff caught my attention. I have a client um, who's a sort of profoundly impaired uh, developmental kid. Yeah. Who has, when I met her, she was having two or 300 seizures per hour. Oh, wow. Um, now she's down about 50 or 60 per hour through neurofeedback. Um, but recently her mom started working with her on this carbon dioxide rebreathing system, which seems to provoke a developmental challenge that improves uh, seizure status in a lot of these really profoundly impaired brains. There's something oh. about this CO2 tolerance, maybe the EPO upregulation that you're describing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the neuroscience here myself yeah. all that well, but it sounds like we're actually, you know, from an impaired individual as well as a peak performance athlete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's well, something similar being tapped into my, here. My, my the- our, our theory has always been a th- is that if an elite level athlete's doing it, a child should be able to do it. If a child can't do it, an elite level athlete can't do it. Interesting. To, to, Bar, th- it, yeah. and they're just fundamental. They're both congruent with, with being, be having a body. 100%. Yeah. Great. Well, that's a bit of a mic drop moment. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> folks, uh, thanks for listening to another episode of Head First with Dr. Hill. Thank you to my guests, Brian and Aaron McKenzie. And I think we're going back to uh, Peak Brain now and talk yes. about your brains, but we'll do that off air, folks. So, uh, <laughs> thanks so much for being part of the show. Thank you for Thank having us. And uh, I'd love to come down and see you guys in Newport Beach yes. soon. Yes, come on down. Come right, in the great. water. Thank you. I will. <laughs> <laughs>